Hi, I'm Gabriele Paone and I'm a master's student in anthropology at the University of Oxford. I've often heard stories regarding the benefits of practicing a martial art, and more specifically Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, the one I practice myself. Intrigued by this aspect, I became interested in the impact it may have on children, especially those living in a difficult social context. There is a growing literature in the social sciences concerning the practice of martial arts, especially among adults. Another literature also exists with regard to minors, but I hadn't found any academic study on the impact of BJJ on children, especially in a community characterized by a high level of crime and juvenile delinquency as the one object of investigation of this study. I therefore decided that the best place to start would have been where BJJ was born, Brazil. I have identified in the Terere Kids project a concrete example of how BJJ can help the children who live in a tough reality. In fact, this project operates in a favela of Rio de Janeiro, one of the notoriously hardest contexts in the world. What presented here are the results of a six-month field research conducted from January to June 2018. I like to define my experience as observing participation, because I was not a simple observer who participated in the same context, but I took an active part in training with children and adolescents, and accompanied them to various competitions in which sometimes I myself competed. Cantagallo Pavao Pavosigno, also known as PPG or Moro do Cantagallo, is one of the over 700 favelas of Rio de Janeiro and is located on one of the hills that raises among the rich neighborhoods in the south of the city. About 25,000 people live within the community. Brief terminological clarification. The term favela, commonly used to refer to the poorest urban suburbs of Brazilian cities, is considered pejorative by their inhabitants who prefer the term comunidade, community. In this presentation, the term favela is used only for expositionary clarity. In order to investigate whether and how jiu-jitsu could bring benefits to the youngest members of the community, it is first necessary to know how childhood is experienced in this environment. The analysis will focus here on three specific elements. The family environment, the criminality and the hypersexualization of children. An aspect that I believe is the basis of various difficulties experienced by many minors is the absence of the paternal figure. Who do you live with, Joao? I ask one of the children after training. With my mom and my brothers, he answers me from the top of my shoulders. And dad? He's in jail, replies his older brother Pedro, who meanwhile works beside us, starting a discussion between the two on the possible date of his release. Most of the children I met during my research didn't have a stable paternal figure because either the father didn't take responsibility, or he was dead or incarcerated. Furthermore, Early age sexual intercourses are very common, without the use of protections, and with various occasional partners. Consequently, the number of unwanted pregnancy is very high. I often mistook some young girls for the sisters of the baby they were holding in their arms, discovering only later that they were actually their mothers. Many favelas in Rio de Janeiro are under the control of armed criminal groups, and PPG is no exception. In fact, it is entirely in the hand of the drug traffickers belonging to the Commando Vermelho faction. Much has been written about the organized crime in Rio de Janeiro, and there are two aspects on which I want to focus here. The young age of drug traffickers, and the motivations that push a child to enter the gang. As for the age, many traffickers are minors, and most of those I spoke with were between 15 and 20 years old. The youngest trafficker I met was a lookout of just 11 years old. The economic gain deriving from criminal activity is the immediate most attractive benefit, especially in a community in which the majority of residents live with a salary below the minimum wage. Furthermore, the chances of advancement are greater than in regular economy. Crime represents therefore the possibility of social climbing for people who are unlikely to have the same gains, material and symbolic, in the legal world. However, money is not the only motivation that drives a boy to enter crime at PPG. Nobody says anything to the trafficker, he is the law, even if he is outside the law. These words perfectly summarize the second reason why I believe that a young man decides to enter the criminal world in PPG, which is the social status acquired. The figure of the trafficker appeared to me as a negative hero in the community, in opposition to the positive hero represented by the fighter. Defining a narcotrafficker as hero might seem paradoxical, but it's exactly in this way that it appears to the eyes of many of the youngest members of the community. It is precisely for this reason that all traffickers I met have never denied their activities and do nothing to hide from being criminals. Everywhere in the community, and almost at any time, one can hear songs at a very loud volume, 
Most of these belong to funk music, which has lyrics that are pornographic or apologetic of narcotraffic, as shown in the text reported in this slide. I have often asked myself how it is possible to let children to be exposed to the reality described above, and I found the solution in the answer given to many of my questions. It is normal in the community, Gabri. Whether I showed my perplexity in front of 13 years old pregnant teenagers, or asked why a trafficker had been killed, or why none of them would pose a problem in letting children listen to funk music, in the community it's normal, I was answered, often accompanied by a shrug or a laugh. But what do we mean by normal? In PPG, it is normal to see drug traffickers on the street, it is normal for a girl who has just entered a puberty to be pregnant, it is normal to have a father in jail. With this, I obviously don't believe that the child who lived in the Western world is right and precisely normal, as opposed to that experienced by the children of PPG. What I want to highlight here is the traumatic effects of the children of the community resulting to the exposure to the adventure and reality. As said, many children grow up without a paternal figure and have been greatly impressed by how much children feel the lack of a father. Every time the children saw me, they ran to me screaming my name and hugged me. They are so touched to you because they miss their father, tells me one day a mother who's walking the road with us. One afternoon in the gym, Felipe, four years old, said, Look, Luis, this is my dad, while hugging the articulated mannequin that is used for training and that is almost the size of an adult man. He's my dad, he's my dad, continues to repeat, hugging the mannequin and smiling, while the other child approached and replied, No, it's my dad, starting to hug him as well. It was a touching moment, also because I knew the story of both. Felipe's father was killed and Luis one was in jail. As anticipated, I deem this luck is one of the reasons that push a young man to approach criminality, where a more adult trafficker welcomes him as if he were his own child. More than once, I have heard an older trafficker addressing a younger one indicating him as meu filiote, my cub. This hypothesis was further strengthened when I discovered that the fringe of the Commando Vermelho that controls Cantagallo is called Tropa do Pai, literally the father's troop in a symbolic imaginary where the Dono, the head of the community, is seen as a father next to whom the sons fight. Children at PPG are constantly exposed to violence and war, between factions of different traffickers or between traffickers and police, and this is reflected in an almost obsessive way in their actions. I have seen children embracing like a weapon crackers or an apple, and the same reality is reflected also in their drawings. Children are also overly exposed to sexuality, mainly through funk music, which has profound consequences. In addition to the already mentioned premature pregnancies, I have often seen children dancing, imitating sexual movement or showing their genitals. This environment therefore makes children extremely eroticized by making a part of a sphere, the sexual one, which should not concern them at such a young age. Although for some elements of the community we can talk about cultural relativism, we cannot talk about normality in a child who hugs a man in calling it dead. We cannot talk about normality in the narcotraffic experience as a game. We cannot talk about normality in two five years old children who imitate a sexual intercourse. The reality of the favela appeared to me to be crossed by extreme contrasts, for example, between the wealth of adjacent tourist areas and the poverty of the local streets between the criminality of drug traffickers who enforce a strict code of conduct in the community and the policemen who sell weapons to those same traffickers, between pornographic funk music and the extreme religiosity expressed by the same traffickers who listen to it. A confusion that is reflected also in the children. Do you prefer church music or funk music? Andre asks Miguel, who is drawing next to him. Mm, funk music, he replies. And do you prefer church music or a gunshot? Church music. It is precisely among these contrasts that comes the work of the Terere Kids Project and Cantagallo Jiu Jitsu Projects, very often the only actors who teach children the distinction between good and bad. In 1997, Fernando Terere, a future five times world champion, starts giving free lessons for the children of the community. Currently, there are three Brazilian Jiu Jitsu gyms in PPG the Fernando Terere Academy and two Cantagallo Jiu Jitsu Academies. The three projects currently teach about 200 young fighters aged between 4 and 17 years old. The Terere Kids project was born in 2013 with the goal of improving the lives of children of PPG through the teaching of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in a safe place, far from the difficult environment that, as we have seen, characterizes the community. I believe the Terere Kids project, as well as Cantagallo BJJ, brings benefits in the lives of younger members on several fronts. 
To get into the gym and train, it is necessary to be clean, which is not always obvious in an environment that is characterized by deficient sanitary condition and where many children work barefoot on the street. Terere is like a father to me. These are the words that have been said to me by many teenagers who train in the gym and can be interpreted as the result of a family environment that in most cases is characterized by the absence of the father figure. Thus, it is precisely in this sense that the master of BJJ is identified as a father who will certainly not replace the biological one, but which at least partially feels the lack caused by his absence. Further issues come from drug or alcohol addiction, or from having a family member involved in narco-trafficking. In all these cases, I believe that BJJ can offer children a different and alternative behavioral pattern. The first idol of every child is in fact his own parent, father or mother, and it is well known that children tend to imitate the behavior of adults around them, especially those whose they recognize a position of value. It is precisely in this sense that I noticed how the martial art teacher represents for many of these children a role model in alternative to the godfather that is acquired in the criminal world. If you don't hug them, the world hugs them, I'm told. And I noticed how the BJJ professors were particularly attentive to the behavior of children outside of the gym. They often discussed it with a boy who wasn't doing well at school. Other times they scolded the guy who had started posting on social media photos that portrayed him smoking marijuana. One day a girl from the community went to the traffickers to denounce the behavior of her 17-year-old brother, who started to be violent at home. The traffickers told her that if that happened again, they would punish him. She also asked for his brother's removal from the gym, but the teachers decided to stay close and try to help him. He needs to be helped now. If we throw him out, then he ends up doing the other life, in crime. The Terere Kids Project also provides children with a safe space, that of the academy, where there are no police, shootings or drug trafficking. Why are you taking Paolo to Jiu-Jitsu? I asked one of the mothers one day why we are taking the children back home. Because it's safe here. Me and the mom of Rafael saw them playing on the street, putting sand in plastic bags, pretending to sell drugs. In the gym instead they can stay away from this for a few hours. We take them to the gym so they don't stay on the street and don't see those things. And then, because they get tired, so when they go back home, they go to bed. As the trafficker is a negative hero, I likewise deem that the fighter can be considered a positive hero. In PPG community, in fact, those who practice martial art, especially Jiu-Jitsu, are highly respected. It repeatedly happened to me to hear traffickers talk about Terere, referring to him with the expression O Mestre, the master. I found interesting to note that, as in the community appear various writings depicting CV, the initials of Commando Vermelho, as well as FT, Fernando Terere, or stickers of the academy that I saw stuck everywhere. I also often met people wearing the gym shirt or cap, even if they were not training BJJ, and see geese hanging out of the windows, with the logo of the gym prominently displayed. Just as the trafficker shows off his rifle, often those who practice BJJ proudly carry the gi under their arms or wear gym clothes. Another benefit deriving from practicing BJJ is given by the distance, even if temporary, from exposure to pornographic funk music. Instead, in the gym there are no gender differences, but boys and girls, men and women, train together without any distinction, without any form of discrimination. A discrimination to which the inhabitants of the community are used on various fronts, for example legally. In fact, living in a favela is considered an aggravating circumstance if one is convicted of drug possession or trafficking. In opposition to this discriminatory tendency, everyone in the gym is welcome and can train regardless of gender, sexual, religious, political orientation or provenance. All the young children who practiced BJJ told me that they were training because they liked it and because they learned to defend themselves. The older teenagers had instead a more forward-looking vision. Their goal was usually to open a BJJ academy abroad, usually in the US. This goal is not a teenage dream, but represents a real possibility for these boys and girls. In fact, of the more than 30 black belts that the community has produced, many live abroad as top BJJ competitors and teachers. Here the discussion deals with another interesting aspect. As we've seen, the community is a complex environment with limited opportunities, where most of the children attend state schools with an extremely low level of education. According to a report by Miller and McKenna 2016, Brazil is only 55th out of 61 countries analyzed for the quality of public education. 
Now, BJJ is obviously not an alternative to school, which should be paramount, but is a fact that public education in which most young people in the community study offers limited prospects for the future and above all, more importantly, is not considered by young people as an investment for their future. On the contrary, opening a BJJ academy represents the goal of most teenagers at Torkel too, and this may be a less utopian job opportunity than it might seem at first glance. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, as the name suggests, was created in Brazil, and Brazilians have for a long time maintained the monopoly in the most important fighting leagues and BJJ academies. Only since a few years, in fact, non-Brazilian athletes have started to impose themselves in the competitive world and open their own gyms. Furthermore, outside of Brazil there are many academies where the professor is a purple or even a blue belt and BJJ is taught only for amateur purposes. In addition to this, being Brazilian would give them an immediate cultural recognition in the martial art arena. I have often wondered which is the greatest benefit that BJJ brings to the young people in the community, and I have found the answer in the notion of stability. This is defined as the ability to remain in the same relative place or position in spite of disturbing influences, capacity for resistance to displacement, condition of being in stable equilibrium. The reality of the community appeared in my eyes as characterized by strong imbalances and contrast, as I tried to show so far. Young girls pregnant and boys with war weapons, religious music or funk music, underage traffickers who are 10 times more than an adult with a regular job. In all of this, the practice of BJJ, through the work of the Terere Kids Project and the Cantagallo Jiu Jitsu Project, has the ability to help the younger members of the community to stay on the right path, as I've often been told. I present now two positive examples for the young children of the community, Moicano and Buddha. Moicano, a nickname given to Jonathan for the particular haircuts he uses to appear at the gym with, is the most promising talent of the Terere Kids project. He is 18 now and he has already won multiple worlds, European and the Pan American Championship. He also regularly goes to train in the US thanks to a sports scholarship. Buddha is now 30 years old. He began training BJJ as a child and has won several competitions, including the Copa del Mundo. However, he entered the Commando Vermelho at a young age and after being arrested, served six years in prison. Once freed, he went back to the criminal world but shortly after decided to leave the gang to return to be a full-time athlete. Buddha is very well known within the community, for his criminal past, but above all because he left it voluntarily. He turned the page showing himself and many other young people in the community that there is another way. Today he trains, gives BJJ lessons and he's helping other young boys to leave the criminal world, thanks to BJJ and his own example. To conclude, in a harsh environment such as the one of Cantagallo, Pavao, Pavosinho, Favela, I have observed that BJJ provides children with a safe environment, away from the excesses that characterize the community, a fixed point, a direction, a place in which they are not discriminated but in which they show their worth regardless of skin color, gender or religious orientation, a place in which to find a role model in opposition to that of the godfather in drug trafficking, a place in which to see with one's own eyes and have as an example someone like Moicano who really made it to live a life on the right path as they say here, but also someone who found it after losing it, like Buddha. Here Jiu Jitsu saves lives, I was told when I arrived. It's really like this. Here are the references. I would also like to thank these institutions for their support and thank you all for listening.